Hello, my name is Stacy Scrabus, and I am the Registered Dietitian and Wellness Coordinator here at Daytona Beach. I first want to thank those in attendance, as well as in person, as well as virtual. I also want to thank those who made this possible. The first person I'd like to start, uh, start off by thanking is my supervisor, Pam Patrone. She's Director of Health Services. Kenny Corbin, Director of Human Resources. James Roddy, Director of Internal Communication, as well as Nick Peaks, AV Support Specialist. Before introducing our speaker, there will be a question and answer that will take place after the presentation that both my supervisor, Pam, and I will address the questions. Our speaker is a psychotherapist and chaplain. He has, has more than 30 years of experience in coaching people through life's problems, unexpected changes, and the losses that bring tough times. He is a seminary prepared, um, prepared ordained minister and a licensed professional clinical counselor. He holds master's degrees in the field of theology, philology, and clinical social work, a combination of education and training that enables him to provide effective psychosocial and spiritual counseling and support. I have known the speaker for many years, and we have actually shared the podium on several occasions. He is a dynamic speaker and a friend, and it is my pleasure and honor to introduce and welcome Mark Spivey. Thank you. I have to live up to all that now. Welcome to Coping with Chaos, Tips for Adapting to Unexpected Change. And what I'd like to do before I begin is show you a picture. How many of you know what this is from? You can say it out loud for the audience that's here. Seinfeld episode. About, oh, in the end of February, in the beginning of March, this became a symbol of coronavirus. Everybody seemed to be going for the toilet paper and not the masks. So I like the image, coping with chaos, tips for adapting to unexpected change in a culture of controversy. Since then, me and a friend have partnered with CBD oils to CBD oil infused toilet paper so that people can calm their butts down. I think it's a great idea and I think it'll help us during this pandemic and this culture of, oh my goodness, what's going on? Now, this talk that I'm going to give is a one in about a three or four day series, and so it's quite general, but I'm going to leave you with some tips, some basic ideas on what we can all do, not just during coronavirus and economic downturn and strange new ways that the world are trying to get along now, but in general, things we can do in our lives to leave us with more coping skills and mechanisms. All right. That's not important. There's a time for everything. We live in a culture of controversy, incivility, and continuous change. Chaos, essentially, easily put, is a cloudy reordering of what is, or what used to be normal. Things once considered stable are now uncertain. Our jobs, our relationships, our houses, our food, our health, our future, everything we thought we knew that was supposed to be secure, we realized as a result of coronavirus that all along we've been living somewhat of an illusion, that these things aren't really as real as we think, but it comforts us as human beings to try and hold on to things that we believe are fixed and fast, and it's just quite simply more easy to live life if we believe that everything has order, there is no chaos, but in fact, chaos is all the time with us. We just don't always notice it unless it shows its face. And if it shows its face, as I was talking with Stacy earlier, it's usually only here for a while. Like if you're a woman and you're a mother and you're listening, you know that being pregnant is nine months of, oh my gosh, get this out of me. But nine months is bearable because you have an end goal. You know that at the end, a beautiful bundle of joy is coming into your life, ideally. But this feels like you're pregnant all the time right now, and we don't have an end to sight. So how do you endure something when everything seems like it just keeps going on and on and on? What is chaos? 
I chose this from 1859, Tale of Two Cities, Charles Dickens. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epic of belief. It was the epic of incredulity. It was the season of light. It was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. For many of you listening, for many of you not listening but on the planet right now, we've never lived in a time such as this. We've never had all of this happen to us, so not only does it feel new, we don't really have natural coping skills for something like this. You talk to someone who was in World War II, they would know how to deal with coronavirus. They've got skills. They've already been through a lot. You talk with a lot of veterans of any conflict, they know how to cope, they know not only how to survive, but how to thrive. But your everyday person, they are unprepared to know exactly how to cope when things aren't going well and there's no end in sight and everywhere you look you're getting different responses. How do you feel? Are you okay? The sudden awareness of mental health status has all of a sudden become an issue. Now, we all know, don't we, that mental or emotional health is always present. We just like to ignore it until something goes wrong. But now it's actually a conversation topic because people are being forced to do things that they're not equipped to do for longer periods of time. So mental health is now a concern. It's now a topic when, in fact, it's always been one, not always a popular one, but it's always been present and accounted for. But mental health challenges now are a bit different than they used to be pre-COVID-19 because any crisis changes our coping mechanisms, changes our dynamics, and now people who once had jobs are at home all the time. And that's not always good because a lot of people, as we know, go to work to get away from family and vice versa. You have that buffer and that back and forth break and so many people are experiencing dynamics they've never experienced before and they're not coping well. We'll talk a little bit about that in a minute about some of the ways that are unhealthy in coping versus some of the ways that are actually healthy in coping. There's a need for a sense of control in uncertain times. All of us want to control what's happening insofar as we are able. Whether we're control freaks or not doesn't even matter. We just want some sense of order, some sense of control over our day, where we go, and a feeling of not just I'm safe, but I'm living my life. And that's eluding a lot of people today. In times of controversy, how do you know who or what to believe? It's difficult, isn't it? I know that I'm speaking to the technologically savvy in the room and through the computer because obviously we live in a world where technology is pretty much connected to everything. So through technology and through technological platforms, when you don't have somebody's eyes to look in, how do you know what's true? How do you know what isn't true? How do you know what's fabricated? It's difficult to find in the world that we live in today. And I, I won't talk too much about this next slide, but I will show it to you. The culture of controversy, when I unpack this whole talk, looks at each of these topics in detail. Race, meaning our human race and our different ethnic diversities and how we experience it. Science, there are people today that are actually doubting whether science is true or not. Whoever thought you'd live long enough to actually see people say, that's not a scientific fact, or that's not true. But we're living in a time now where people don't believe science. I have people in my life who believe that COVID-19 is a hoax. It is a lie. It is a conspiracy. And they just do not believe the science before their eyes. There's reasons for that. Politics, obviously, civility. What's civility? Courteousness being kind, being nice, being thoughtful. It doesn't have to be opening a door for someone. It's simple things. Thank you, look someone in the eye, pay attention to them, actually listen to them and be present instead of talking on the phone and distracting yourself from the human being in front of you. We've lost a sense of civility. And this happened before COVID showed up. Now it's pretty much gone. We are uncivil to one another. Conspiracy theories, artifice. What's artifice? 
It's a fancy word that basically means disinformation. You have a lot of people who are setting out to deliberately deceive whichever public they're talking to. So we get a lot of disinformation. You don't know what to believe because you don't know how to fact check it because even where you go to fact check it, that's not something you're sure of. So all of this leads to the anxiety and the depression and the uncertainty about who's real, what's right, what's wrong. Virus. I've got people, raise your hands for those of you in the room, if you know somebody who thinks the virus isn't real. Look at, just so you guys, everyone except one in the room, I know dozens, I have members of my family that don't think the virus is real, even though I have sat in the room and watched people take their last breath, they do not believe the virus is real. They just refuse to accept it. Why? Well, it's easier to believe that it's not real than to accept the truth. This just can't be happening. This just can't be happening. Masks, you got the great masks war. I think today is the unofficial burn your mask day. I have a younger, younger nephew who keeps track of all the latest crazes and viral crazy things that happen online. And apparently in some locations, for those that don't believe the masks are constitutional, it's burn your mask day because there's controversy over it. Should you or shouldn't you? What good does it do? What good doesn't it do? So these are the things that we talk about if we were to do the whole course, but we only have another 35 or 40 minutes, so I'm just gonna offer you the tips on how to get through all of this, and then some. And maybe some things that I didn't actually mention. Here's the way I see what's happening. This is unique and personal to me. So this is not something that everyone would see, but, but with my background in death and dying, trauma, suicide, murder, and always seeing terrible things happen and people finding their way through it, what I feel is going on is we are experiencing a profound and prolonged, sustained sense of loss. What are we losing? Not just people by death, but normalcy. You see, a loss is defined by many things. Loss of income, loss of your idea of a normal, simple day, loss of personal freedoms, routines, rites of passage. What do I mean by rites of passage? Can't get married, can't have funerals, can't say goodbye to your loved ones. These regular things that we consider normal, loss of our jobs, loss of our status, they are felt and experienced psychologically and emotionally in the same way that a human being's loss would be felt and experienced. But most people in society, unless they've lost someone, don't recognize the symptoms of grief. They don't know what they're feeling. They just know they don't feel okay. So when I ask the question, are you okay? They go, eh, or they lie and say, fine. But you can see in their eyes they're not because they don't know that they're experiencing grief and bereavement having lost the life they thought they could keep forever. I have people who walk up to me and say, Mark, when is this all going to end? As if I would know. Mark, I just want my life back. I just want things to go back the way they were. And my response is something along the lines of, you didn't like your life before. You hated it. You came into my office and complained on a regular basis. Now you want it back? It's interesting how we perceive things and how things change in our lives as we move through challenges and struggles and difficulties. Loss leads to emotional deregulation. Without getting too fancy, here are the top ones. People get angry. There's all kind of places you could put anger. Most stuff it, and it shows up in different ways. Angry. Denial. There are people that just simply, if I don't believe it's there, it won't be real. The little child who just does this and believes that if you do this, you can't see. People actually behave this way in real life. If I just deny and defy, then it won't be real for me. I can just live in my own bubble and I can create it. The next one is pretty common. Fear, anxiety, sadness. It's basically an emotional roller coaster. So when we're feeling what we're feeling in this time of profound loss of the way life used to be with no end in sight as to when it's going to go back to the way it was and if that will ever even look the same, people aren't sure. They don't have good footing. They don't know what to do next. It's a huge, complex conversation, which is why it's a three-day course. But for the sake of 
our time together, I just want to skip to the stuff that I tell most people on, no matter what the circumstances are, this is how you get through. And you won't be surprised at the next slide. Tips for keeping our heads. I call these Beatitudes. Because isn't life all about the attitude? The attitude we adopt to life. And here's what I've noticed over 41 years. This is just me and what I've noticed. People tend to choose one of the two, an attitude of fear or an attitude of faith. Now, by faith, I don't mean religion. By faith, I mean believing in themselves, believing in someone or something, believing that time will get better, a positive, hopeful, optimistic attitude. This too shall pass versus an attitude of fear. Everything always goes wrong. A lot of people live their lives based on fear. They live fear-driven lives. People even go to work based on fear. Fear of what will happen if they don't. Fear of not getting a paycheck for a job they actually can't stand in the first place so they can keep funding a life they really, really hate. But that's the American dream, that's the American way. And unless something like this comes along called coronavirus and compels us to think differently, we don't think differently. We just figure things will work themselves out. So what are the Beatitudes I'd like to share with you today? Am I messing you up, camera lady? Okay, I'll try harder. Number one, be unplugged. Be unplugged. Ignore sensationalism, ignore speculation, ignore the incredulous. The brain loves the power of suggestion. The brain loves to use the imagination. You all in this room and then some know that our imagination is always better than reality. We imagine a situation is going to be so much better or so much worse than it really is. And if we had time, I'd give you lots of funny examples. But you know it. Watch what you filter through your brain. Filter something credible. Select one media coverage that you trust. Just select one and only control your doses. Don't stay overly connected. Even people at the hospital who have enough sense to know better, they keep their notifications on so that every single thing is always being fed to them. So they are overstimulated all day long. And that's in addition to their actual work and the people that walk up to them. And they don't realize what that kind of connectivity does to the psyche, to the social experience, and just to one's own sense of soul. Be conscientious. Don't be obsessive. Now, I'm not suggesting you unplug completely. Stay informed. If you need to know about the statistics of coronavirus or how many deaths there are or hospitalizations, check it every three days. It's like a soap opera. Not much will have changed. And if it does, believe me, your friends will tell you because they'll text you. So my first beatitude is be unplugged. And this is unique. Each person can custom fit this on their own. Find a way to not always be fixated and plugged in. It creates anxiety. It feeds anxiety. And it makes sure you stay on edge all the time. See, we live in a culture today where you don't want to miss anything. Well, don't worry. Everyone's filming everything, so you won't miss it. Eventually, you'll get to see it. So that's the first beatitude. The second one is be optimistic. Avoid catastrophic or fantastical thinking. Practice WAS therapy. This always is a little trick I play on people. Other psychotherapists I work with say, what's that? And it's my own little acronym. WAS is what my grandpa taught me when I was little, wait and see. Practice wait and see, because we really don't know. We can forecast and we can model, but a lot of things in life, you have to wait them out. Sometimes somebody will call and they'll be in a crisis at the moment or it's a perceived crisis by them and I will, I'm telling a secret now, I will deliberately not call them back for 15 minutes because usually it'll solve itself. But I have to give it a little bit of time and frankly I'm usually on the hour seeing people so I can't get back to them for an hour. By the time I call them back or text them back, it's solved. So in life, a lot of times, it's good to practice wait and see. Peace of mind is not something you find or discover. It's something you construct. It's something you develop. You develop a sense of calm and control. Practice optimism with a plan. Notice I put in parentheses, prayer plus plan. 
We all see people and make fun of them, and they're all over TV, and someone walks by someone who looks hungry, and you'll hear them say invariably, I'll pray for you, and they just keep right on walking by. My first thought is, why are you praying for them? Feed them. If they're truly hungry, your prayer is not going to feed them. You're right there. Handle it. But we do this. We do this. We don't have a plan or a follow-up. So practice optimism, but be smart about it. When it comes to being optimistic, manage your own mood. What do I mean by that? Well, Stacy this morning came to work, and she was in a good mood this morning when she came to work. Things were going well, and then I saw her two or three hours into the morning, and I said, how's your day? And she said, it's fine. It was fine until so-and-so did so-and-so, and then so-and-so. So now the whole day's ruined. This didn't really happen. I'm just using her. <laughs> My response was, Stacy, you mean to tell me that you were absolutely wonderful and happy? and you allowed somebody else to steal your mood? We do this, don't we? Somebody takes our parking spot, somebody says something, somebody doesn't say something, somebody doesn't say hello to us, and we extrapolate and assume, and we let somebody else manage our mood. Let me give you some advice that's hard to take, but it's always true. You are responsible for your own mood, it is your job to be you. Nobody else gets to do that. If somebody walks up to you and says something like, don't be sad, very politely look at them and say, don't tell me what to be and don't tell me how to feel. That's my job. You manage your mood, I'll manage mine. Now, we think we're helping, we're not. We're intruding on somebody else's mood. So practice mood management. It is your responsibility to be in charge of your thoughts, to be in charge of your mood and your feelings, and to be in charge of your own choices and behaviors. And yet, we live in America, so in America, there's a lot of money to be made on making it somebody else's fault that we are not in a good mood. Mood is personal inside responsibility. This is powerful. If you can conquer this and master this, you will change your life. And other people will look at you and they'll ask you, what meds are you taking? because they won't know how you're staying so happy and upbeat and positive. It's got nothing to do with medication. We have a lot more ability to influence ourselves than we give ourselves credit for. So, be optimistic. Be proactive. Avoid procrastination. Things won't just go away. You don't have to answer this because I know it's true. Do you know anybody in your life, maybe it's you, that you just keep thinking to yourself, in time, it'll just go away. And yet, a year has passed, a month has passed, it's not gone. It might be masked or covered. Things typically don't go away, particularly if they're problems or challenges or a crisis. People practice this all the time about dentists. Eh, it'll stop hurting. Have you ever, on your way to the dentist, had it stop hurting? It stops as you're driving there. And when you park, you're like, well, I'm fine now. I'm going to go home. I know people that actually do that because they just don't want to face and handle and tackle the situation. Talk with someone if you're upset about something, whoever it happens to be. Find someone capable of listening to what I call hard-to-hear material. A lot of the things that we have in our hearts and in our inner lives, it's tough to say out loud, and not everyone is capable of listening to it. Not everyone is capable of even hearing it, much less helping you process it. So find someone you trust. I listed a few of the ones that a lot of people trust. Counselor, chaplain, pastor, friend, mentor. Someone where you can talk safely without judgment and where it's going to stay where it belongs. Every one of us needs this. Every one of us needs this, not just during coronavirus, all the time. All the time. Therapy is not for people who are weak or sick or frail or vulnerable. Therapy is talking and loving and listening. It's a whole lot more listening than it is talking. A lot of people today, especially in our country, are starved for someone to just listen to them, just to pay attention to them, even for just a few moments because we're all so busy and we're all so distracted. Expressing thoughts and feelings is, of course, cathartic. It offers validation, reassurance, relief, and normalization. 
That's a lot of things that can positively improve your life just by having someone to talk to. You can use multiple methods, face-to-face, -face, phone, text, email, FaceTime. I prefer face-to-face. -face. In our world now, as long as you're far enough away, we can still talk, but it's hard to do this. This is a perfect, ideal setting, but it's not always so easy to do that. But a phone call, I get lots of phone calls and FaceTime from people who physically can't get to see me and they'll just take 10 or 15 minutes just to say, am I okay or am I thinking about this correctly? That may be you or maybe someone that you're that person for. So be proactive, take care of yourself. Be mindful, you hear this a lot, it's a fancy classic word, but it's more than just progressive thinking, be present and accounted for. You know how easy it is to ruin your right now by living in the past or the future? We believe and we act like we have time, and we all know that we don't. I am in an honored, sacred, privileged position to be in the presence every single day, seven days a week, of people leaving the planet, leaving their bodies by virtue of the work that I've chosen to do, which is my passion in life. And if there's one thing I've learned, we don't have the time we think we have. We can do everything right, and our bodies are still limited. Time is the one non-renewable resource we can't purchase more of, but we do enjoy believing that we have more. Don't do that. For your own sake, don't put it off. Be mindful of your time. If there's someone that you need to say, I love you, thank you, I forgive you, do you forgive me? Or if you need to say, do you know what you've done for my life? Say it before the sun sets because you may not be here tomorrow to say it. Why do I say that out loud? Not to frighten us, but to keep us real. Because every day is all we have. If you happen to make it to the next morning, rinse and repeat. This way you won't miss your life. This way you'll always be present and accounted for and nothing gets put off. If you put things off like this, you end up having two new friends. They're not the kind of friends you want. They're called guilt and regret. To live guilt and regret free, handle every day as if it's all you have. Live with passion and you won't miss out. Positive self-talk, I just give you an example. I am healthy, I am prepared. I take care of myself through sleep, nutrition, and exercise. I am at peace. Be responsible. This is my favorite beatitude. It's also everybody else's non-favorite because we don't like to be responsible for ourselves. We like somebody else to take responsibility for us. Be responsible. Focus on what you can control. Notice the word can is italicized and it's capitalized. There are things you can control. You can't control coronavirus. You can't control economic downturns. You can't control police and racial and civil unrest. But you can control your reaction to it, how much of it you feed yourself. You can control what you expose yourself to. So it's normal to be sad and to feel unsure about things. But adapt. Practice adapting. Focus on what's going Going right in your life. Start keeping a, this is my what's going right journal. We used to call them gratitude journals. Call it what you want to, but there's a lot of things that go right in our lives every single day, but we overlook it because we're trained to look at what's wrong. Change your thinking and notice what's right. Notice what's right. Assume responsibility for your health. I've listed my five pillars of stay well. They're common sense, but oh my goodness, they're so easy, they're free, they don't cost anything, but hardly anybody will do it. Sleep, exercise, nutrition, hygiene, mindfulness. The average American walks around sleep deprived and dehydrated. And we're supposed to be able to make good decisions given what environment we're in. It's important to get your sleep, it's important to exercise. I don't mean join a gym necessarily, just move. Move, 30 minutes a day, seven days a week, not just three days a week. Do it every day. Exercise is not an option. Raise your hands if you peed this morning. Yep, every hand's up. So if urination is not an option, why is exercise? The body is built to move. You don't have to go crazy. Just move. You'll be surprised 
how exercise daily can relieve anxiety and stress and depression. It's very, very healthy, very smart. Nutrition, eat properly. You like to eat junk? Eat it. Eat the good stuff first. Eat it alongside it. Your body starts asking for what you give it. The old expression, you are what you eat, is very true. Very true. Hygiene, common sense, mindfulness, custom size. Not everyone has the same idea of mindfulness. Some people like to go on the beach and walk or run because the feeling and the sounds of water and movement and the freedom is sort of improving their sense of soul and their sense of everything's all right. Whatever works for you is what works for you. But be mindful of your own life. Pay attention to it. Be practical. Practice gratitude. We've already talked a bit about this. Practice common sense living. I like less is more because to me less really is more. A lot of people in this country and other countries, they have a lot of stuff. Raise your hands in the room if you have stuff. Yeah, stuff, stuff. And then you run out of room for your stuff and you got to pay for your, a place to store your stuff. And it's stuff you haven't used in years and you don't even know why you have this stuff. If a fire came or a hurricane came, you wouldn't grab that stuff. You'd grab the core stuff and you put it in the car and try and get away. Why do we clutter our lives with stuff? Well, I believe it's because we like to distract ourselves from ourselves. Because it's hard for us to be with us. Because we don't like often what we see. Because we don't do the inside job work that we could do. So be practical. Be common sense. Less is more. And the final one, be human. This might seem too simple for words, but you'd be surprised at how difficult it is for people to stop being humans doing and simply being human beings. We have forgotten how to simply be, how to be present, how to be accounted for, how to be here when someone needs for us to simply listen. There's a time to embrace and a time to let go of things. A time to be alert. Be alert, but don't be anxious. Be prepared, but don't be panicked. Be kind, be patient, be funny. That's a powerful line. Be kind, just be nice, be kind. You're not gonna like everyone, everyone's not gonna like you, that's fine, but be kind. Kindness goes a long way. Find one thing you like about somebody, besides their absence, and tell them, tell them. Find a way to compliment and start training your brain to think about what's going right and what's good as opposed to the negativity. Negativity is self-destructive. Be patient, not just with others, but yourself. Be patient with yourself. Some days are good, some days are not so good, some days you're ahead, some days you're not. God willing, and the creek don't rise, the next morning you'll wake up, you got another whole shot at it. Every day it's brand new, it's brand new. Be funny. I use humor all the time simply because life is funny. And I don't think we should take ourselves so seriously. I think it's important to lower anxiety and lift our spirits. Not inappropriate humor that hurts somebody, but humor. There's so many things that are funny. Like the way all of you look in those masks right now, as a matter of fact. And be open is simply what is. What do I mean by that? Just embrace what comes your way. Whatever it is, it's never going to be perfect or exactly the way you imagine it. Be open to what is and accept that this is as good as it gets for this moment. Young couples will sometimes come to me before they get married to see if I think they should get married. I'll ask them a few questions and within 15 minutes, usually within 10, one of them will say, well, I'm not crazy about this, but I think in time that will change. It's very difficult for me to be professional and not laugh at that. But I do honestly say, now you do realize that human beings are complicated creatures and there are parts of us that are not subject to change. So if you love someone, you're going to have to accept them like you do some cars as is. Because that's what love does. And that's what I mean by be open is simply what is. Some things are as good as it gets, and there's lots of good stuff in that as good as it gets, so we can adapt and adjust. So those are my easy, quick Beatitudes. That's the short list. 
Obviously, we could have unpacked this a whole lot more, but given our time frame, I want to be considerate of those who are watching who might have questions. So thank you for your time and your attention, and I'll put my mask back on and sit down. So we will open it up to questions. Um, I, I know uh, that I have one, you know, uh, for myself. Is so you're going through your life and, and you're trying to stop this chaos and not create this chaos. But there's so many demands that are placed on an individual. H how how do you take that time to say enough? Like I I've got to just refocus and try to. Path, well, you're asking a question that everyone uh, jokes about and mentions. Yeah, Mark, I know everything you just said is true. I've always known it, but I don't have time. I have this, 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 and this, and this. Well, the, he, I'll tell you the way I do it, and I'll tell you what I tell other people. We make time for what works for us. We are pretty much, there's a study that just came out two months ago about how much time we throw away daily, the average person, on frittered away nothingness. Guess what it was? More than four hours a day. So there's your time. Now for me, I start early in the morning. I start at four o'clock, and from four to five a.m. is my time, because nobody else is awake, and it's perfect. And I can claim it, so I exercise, and I do all the things that are just for me to keep myself and my psyche all intact, before people start coming and making requests of me. And I've always found that in the morning, when you start your day that way, it sets the tone for your entire day. Now, a lot of people don't like that suggestion because they're not morning people. I wasn't always either. I created my own morningness. I wanted it enough that I said, no way can I do it at the end. I'm gonna have to construct and develop and create a life that lets me be my best self, so I'm gonna have to do this in the morning before everybody else gets to me. So it worked, but I had to make it work. It's a great question, and people are always pulling at you, and it has to do with creating a pace that works for you and having good boundaries. Other people's emergencies aren't yours. It just happens to believe, they think it's yours, and you can easily say, I understand what you're saying, and I know it's important to you, and I will get to you just as soon as blank. Give them a time frame, and then continue to move. But don't let it change your heartbeat, because it doesn't say anything pro or con about you, because other people have an emergency or a sense of urgency that's typically out of your normal schedule, out of your normal uh, day planner as it were. Is it, does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. uh, e each person has to do this differently. Some, some younger people in their teens and 20s and 30s can handle exercising and times in themselves after their work day because they stay up till 11 or 12 or 1 a.m. But I insist on sleep because sleep restores everything. So I'm in bed at 8.30 faithfully. That's almost a religion for me because I know I'm at my best when my body can fix itself during sleep. So I'm not gonna short myself on that. I have to be first. It's like the plane that loses altitude. If it drops down, you reach for the O2. We always teach people, reach for yours first so you can help the other ones. Don't reach for everybody else or you're gonna pass out. Self-care is key. And yet, we're quick, especially in the clinical field and healthcare field or just people helping. We wanna help them so much we get our emotional needs met but if we don't practice self-care, we won't be there for them or us. So you have to sometimes create it. I said way too much to answer that. I love it. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, and we have a question from Rebecca. I am normally a strong person, but I'm finding my default based on fear lately. This has never been the case in my life. What tools can I use to change this baseline? What tools have you already tried? I don't want to say something to Rebecca that she's already tried that hasn't worked. She didn't expect that, did she? I can give a nice, easy, pat-friendly answer, but I'd like to fit it exactly for her needs because a lot of people try a lot of things and then they come and they say, I need a professional to give me other ideas or some haven't tried anything. 
So before I answer the question honestly, if she can get it fast enough through, through the send back, we can always circle back to her if you want. I love this question. Oh no. <laughs> I don't For like those that of look. us who didn't like life pre-pandemic and now <laughs> like the slower pace of life, do you have any advice dealing with chaos when things do go back to normal? I feel guilty for like the slower pace of life while others are suffering. All right, my first thought is try and address the fact of you feeling guilty. Feeling guilt is a misuse of energy. So try and assess, does this really deserve me feeling guilty? Number two, I happen to love what coronavirus as an entity has forced us to do, which is slow down. But I've always enjoyed peaceful, timed pace. And I meet a lot of people who, just like the question, they don't want to go back to normal. Here's my thought. It's just me. I don't think normal's coming back. I don't think the normal we had before, I don't think you're ever going to see it again. Now, that's not me being a prophet of doom. That's just education and years of experience. But I think that's a positive thing. I don't think our normal before was very healthy. This, in a way, is one of... I have a talk I do on the gifts that we get from pain and chaos and coronavirus. And this is one of coronavirus's intentional or accidental gifts. It's forced us to slow down and notice our own breathing. And many of us are finding we're enjoying our life more. And we don't want to go back. It's my personal thought that we're not going to. That we'll go back to a sense of it, but that, in my opinion, is one to two years from now. But it'll look very different. And so while you're enjoying your life now, remember that you, in fact, are in charge of your life. You don't have to go back to the way things were unless that's what you want, if that makes sense. It sounds like the question is, is from somebody who realizes that she or he has more control than they thought they did in the past, and now they like it. Control what you can control. You don't have to go back to a way of life that didn't work for you. And one of the things I'm seeing from a lot of people who are happy about these changes is coronavirus has compelled a change they wouldn't have made on their own. It's forced them to slow down. It's forced them to reevaluate. Why am I working 12 hours a day at a job I hate that doesn't fulfill my heart? And so they're coming to realizations. It's almost as if nature itself said, the country needs therapy. Let me put you all into a state of chill out and you can re-examine your life. So I hope that answers. Okay, going back to Did Rebecca. Rebecca come back? Yes, yes. We didn't chase her off? Okay. Medication and nutrition. I mean, excuse me, meditation. I'm sorry. <laughs> meditation. <laughs> okay, so she's tried meditation and she's tried changing her diet and, and she's still saying that she's experiencing a sense of she's living her life based on fear. How, oh, I want to ask more questions. Um, okay, but in general, uh, meditation and uh, diet changes, they work. However, the key to both of those is consistency and timing. You can't just change your diet and you can't start meditation and expect instant, instant reaction. You need at least a six to eight week, if not three to six month period of time that you give yourself for your body to switch from what it's been used to to the new way of living and thinking and eating and breathing and hopefully with her meditation and with her uh, food, she's moving, she's exercising, and hopefully it's near water. Water is a homing device for all of us. Why? Why is water calm us? Unless we've had a traumatic experience, water is calming because we spend nine months in a water world. It's a homing device. We instinctively felt safe and secure. Food was shuttled down. So water for many people is a natural sort of calming, sort of regrounding place to go. That's why you'll see water effects in a lot of people's buildings or offices to try and create a sense of calm. So I would say to Rebecca, congratulations on meditating, congratulations on nutrition. Give yourself some patience and more time. Exercise, add exercise to it. And I would love to talk to her more so she can have my contact so I could ask her more specifics about because I can add a lot more to that, but I want other people to have a chance to answer. Here's a loaded question. 
aren't they all? <laughs> oh, um, I assert that tensions in the United States will come to a boiling point after the election. No matter who wins, it feels that there's an almost guaranteed chance of civil unrest. How can we deal with a constantly polarizing and politicized world when many of us, at least myself, just want to do our own thing without having to involve ourselves in everyday politics? Is there a way to escape this atmosphere when it feels omnip omnipresent? There's a difference between feeling and actuality. It does feel omnipresent. It does feel constant. This goes back to the first beatitude by, about be unplugged. You don't have to plug in to uh, politics or things that disturb and create a sense of unrest. The person who asked the question is quite correct, but this is not new. There's nothing new under the sun. We have seen civil turbulence since the beginning of human breathing. And each of us handle that in our own unique ways. You are always in charge of how much exposure or deficit you have in your life. Regardless of who wins the election, regardless of how this year ends up, regardless of the next pandemic, regardless of the next problem, regardless of the next hurricane or the next wildfire, we are always in control of our response and managing our own mood and our own life. If you allow yourself to be given over to any and everyone, the world is set and ready and vying and begging and even willing to pay for your attention and your life miles. Be very careful and judicious about who you give your time and your energy and your heart to because they will take it. So I tell people who are overwhelmed by all this constancy because it is constant, but you only know about it if you plug into it and stay connected. You can control that. So I would recommend minimizing your exposure to that level of turbulence if that's disturbing you. Because that will not change. I, again, I want to say more to that, but, but I, I don't want to be disrespectful of other questions, but a lot of people allow too much turbulence in their lives. And there's ways for you to manage yourself in the midst of a storm. Storms don't go away. One will move on and then the second one comes. So life's all about being in constant chaos. The trick is how to stay okay no matter how bad it gets because it will never be a still and calm sea. Because when you have this, look at me, when you have this, what do you have? You're flatlined, you're dead. Sinus rhythm is how you know you're alive. What is that? That's sinus rhythm of the heartbeat, ups and downs. That's our norm. So how to be okay in the midst of chaos is the key. It's the key. That's a great question. She can have my email too if she wants to talk more about that. Okay. All right, the next question is, do you have any advice for helping a struggling adult child through this chaos? Say that again because your mask was messing me up. Do you have any advice for helping a struggling adult child through this chaos? How, all of these questions, how old is the child? Is the child have mental concerns or issues? Is the child developmentally challenged? Is this a, just a normal, everyday adult child? You, that, the question's too vague. Can you say more about it and circle back? And I don't want to give a, a pat answer. I don't believe in pat answers. That person deserves a better response. In general, you respond to an adult child like you would any human, with respect, decency, kindness, patience, and you refer proper help to them if they need it and support. They need a good support system. But I would like to say more about it if I knew more about the situation. She, she said he is a rocket scientist. Yes, quite normal. <laughs> uh, tell her to call Emery Riddle and to discuss this particular problem with the therapists on staff. Yeah. Uh, he needs, like all of us, a safe place to confide and talk, and he needs a good support system. If, in fact, he's a rocket scientist, then he's probably self-isolated, and by nature and by personality, he tends to withdraw and stay away from other people. That kind of thinking brain tends to self-isolate and be sort of the reliant upon one's own self. That's never smart. No one's an island. We're all interdependent. So first things first, connect him to someone that he can relate with or, or react to 
um, and sort of share with because, all, again, all of us need a safe place to say things, even rocket scientists. Yes, sir, one in the room. Oh, my gosh. So you talk a lot about how we control our own food and not other people's food, but sometimes in a work environment, other people's food then infects the rest of the team, so especially if you're a supervisor or something like that. How do you have conversations about, like, your mood is infecting other people, but I can't tell you how you should feel? It's a kind of just a little cyclical. Oh, I love your question, because this comes up all the time in the hospital system setting, is you have people in the workplace, that I call them eggshell people. You know, you don't know, all right, do I walk on eggshells today? Is this person, what mood? So you're right, everyone brings their unique sense of mood and feeling. So how do you have a conversation with someone when, when you know you're going to have to because they're going to keep on being who they are, and how they behave in the work environment or the family environment toxifies and contaminates the whole environment. The best approach and, you know, the one, two, three approach is isolate the person, have a private conversation with that person about the nature of what's going on. And I like to do it not in an accusatory way, but to sort of ask them simple things like, are you happy doing the exact work that you're doing every day? You seem like you're not always happy. Are there things going on? I, I, I don't attack. I first seek to understand instead of insisting on being understood. So there are people I have to manage and take care of. I never just bring them in by the collar. I bring them in by the hand and say, tell me how you, how you are. Tell me what's going on, and often they'll let me know of the different things that are causing that kind of behavior, and then we can address. And sometimes the person will say during the conversation that they know other people are affected by them, and so then we can address the problem and, and sort of problem solve and troubleshoot together. I like to, to bring them with me on an equal level, and that's just my own style of approach as opposed to being punitive, because punitive typically doesn't work, especially in today's culture, because the harder you press, the more you get, and you typically don't really solve the problem. So that's a great question, and it deserves a better answer than I just gave you, but I'm trying to be mindful of our time. So you tell me to stop talking when you need to. I have a question. So uh, as a director of a department, one of the things um, in, in health services now um, within the university, people are, are scared, they're anxious, um, people are, are splitting shifts, they are uh, working different days, some people are working from home, and uh, being in the profession, uh, in, at work, it's so important to connect with one another and create a team. How do you suggest we go about doing that with our with our teams when we're all over the place how are you doing it now what are you doing right now to address that for me i'm i'm meeting we, we have department meetings once a week okay. um at, just to be able to connect go over scenarios talk see what's happening but it's it almost seems formal like i feel like you connect a lot of times in an informal improv way um which we don't seem to have any more in uh, uh improv informal ways because we're so busy. Each one of us are, we're just overwhelmed um, with just trying to keep the campus safe. And a as each department is, I mean, this isn't just a solo effort from health services, it's an effort throughout the entire university. But people are also feeling very disconnected and distant because every individual is so busy that you can't connect as a team. It just, I don't know. We, before we, we would, oh, we're going out to, wherever it may be, right. margaritas or, or whatever it may be, just to try to connect and, uh, but how do you suggest? Your question is a good one and it's, a, it's complex. Um, I have an answer, but it's long. I, I don't know how much time we have. Like, I'm not sure who to look at to tell me to shut up. I, we have uh, five minutes. Oh, goodness. Um, 
Now you got. Now you asked for it. Yeah. Now I'm scared. Um, but realistically, I mean, I think students don't know how to connect with each other. I know student athletes are struggling with this too, with their teamwork. Departments across campus are all trying to figure out. So I think it's a worthwhile question across the board. Yeah. The ba the basic question is, how do you stay connected? Uh, let me start off by saying something that is not intended whatsoever to sound sarcastic because it isn't. However, I have noted that society has gotten exactly what it asked for and now it doesn't want it. We have built platforms and spent billions as a society on how to, hey, how you doing? And now that's all you have. So isn't it interesting that it wasn't good for us as humans and now we're starting to become very aware hey this isn't enough i need more i need human interaction how do we do it when we have to stay distant and apart and safe and so this is a wonderful learning opportunity and, and i think it's going to go full circle and we are going to learn where the role of technology as long as we're in control of it and it doesn't control us and change how we interact with one another is the key a lot of people, agoraphobes, obsessive compulsives, perfectionists, people that I treat regularly love coronavirus because it's, it's basically giving them the perfect world. I've got germaphobes that are saying to me, uh-huh, told you the germs were going to take over, told you, told you. So for some people, yay, this is great. But for the average everyday person, maybe eight, eight and a half out of ten, we don't find that this is enough connection. And, and we're suffering. We're suffering at home. We're suffering at work. A lot of us depended on our work and friendships, not so much our family lives. And some of us, just the reverse of that. And so the, the question becomes, how do we beef up our sense of connectedness? And my answer also includes a component that's not popular, but true nonetheless. The average human being does not know how to be alone with him or herself. We've never practiced. We've never mastered those skills. We distract ourselves from ourselves with intent to not be with ourselves. And now that we're forced to be, we don't know what to do because we don't know ourselves or we don't like what we see and we haven't had a chance to fix it and now we're stuck with it. So again, I see that as opportunity. But in the beginning, it hurts and it's confusing and we don't know what to do to increase our distraction and our connectivity because we don't like this sudden oh my gosh it's just me and my own thoughts and oh my gosh oh my, and that's very distressing for a lot of people so they're doing all kinds of things technologically like webex conversations and they're being creative in in their backyards and staying distancing and they're, they're trying creative new things but the bottom line is your question and pam's question and everyone's question is is are we going to get back to a time when everything was the way it was and you could hang out and have drinks? I would love that, but I don't know that that's going to be around the corner. It may be one day, but until then, we've got to find a way to be okay with the tools that we have. So I'm glad we have technology. Can you imagine coronavirus without devices and without WebEx? And just staying in your homes and, and having to use landlines. So, so it is a, it's a challenge. I, I love the questions. And I'm so glad I'm getting such awesome questions. And it makes me really personally angry. But it's okay. I'll manage my own mood. It makes me angry that I can't say more about it because of time. But I, I'm trying to be respectful. But if you all want to ask this, if any of you want more, I'm happy to write and give specific responses and even give you references because these questions all deserve a proper answer. There, there are two more questions, but we can actually send them to, to you. One of them was about feeling, um, how do, any tips for feeling totally out of control, uh, not uh, that things are out of your control, and is it wrong to suppress emotions? Uh, it's, never, it's never smart to suppress emotions. I wouldn't use the word wrong, but if you suppress anything, you're going to pay a price for it. So if you're willing to suppress and pay later, you may be sorry for the consequences. Typically, people stuff their emotions and suppress their feelings. That's coming out somewhere, and usually it's not when you want it. And if you do that a lot, the pressure builds up, and it shows up in all the wrong spots. And that could cost you your job, your friendships, not to mention how it inflames your body and creates poor health conditions and sleep problems. It's never wise to suppress. 
So it's always good to express. Hence the reason. Find someone who is safe and capable of listening to your need to say certain things. Some things just need to be said. They don't even need answers. They just need a safe place to be said. But you can send anything to me and I'll, I'll sit down and give it a real thoughtful response because I, I don't like giving, I don't believe in pat answers because life's more complex than that. I like to custom fit it. So if you want to invite anyone who's, that you can tell them how to get a hold of me and I'll answer all of them or send them to someone that can. So I, I first just wanted to thank everyone for taking the time out to listen to Mark. Um, I heard Mark speak, and I don't even know if he realizes this, about 25 years ago, and he literally changed my life. I took one thing that he said, and it has just followed me through for the last 25 years. I know I need to stop every once in a while, reconnect, and, and figure that out. Yes, I am. <laughs> um, so thank you all, but thank you very much to Mark. Um, Mark is a, a phenomenal influencer speaker. Um, I just always enjoy hearing him speak and being able to take something um, out of his, his lectures. Um, I, I never go away empty-handed. So thank you very much, Mark, for taking the time to come thank out here and be with us. Thank you. We appreciate it.